Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. This is a Skillshare discussion about moving your art online, and it's hosted by the Cultural Office of the Pikes Peak Region. We are your local arts agency for El Paso and Teller counties. We're a nonprofit, and our work raises the visibility of the creative sector, encourages the community to value it and invest more in it. And we try to strengthen it in a lot of different ways throughout the year. Uh, as soon as the pandemic began, the cultural office began pivoting in how we support, sorry, I'm admitting people, <laughs> nice turnout. Um, the cultural office began as soon as the pandemic began in pivoting in how we support our creative sector as it navigates this change. Across the country and across the world, arts groups are moving their programming online as they choose to, as is strategically important for their personal art practice or for their organization. Uh, so one of the first things that we did was create an arts resource page that connects to funding, relief opportunities, and also best practices for individual artists, nonprofits, and creative businesses. And the link of that is in the right-hand column in the chat of this meeting. We also created peakradar.com virtual. Peakradar.com is the region's cultural calendar. Uh, and we started receiving a cascade of cancellations of live events and then a lot of new virtual events. So Peak Radar Virtual debuted with about seven arts organizations and now features around 40 on any given day presenting virtual uh, programming. So if you'd like to get some ideas, I would encourage you to check out Peak Radar Virtual and uh, see what others are doing. It may jog your thinking about how your own art practice can move online. Another thing that we did was begin the Pro Tips for Creatives series. We wanted to offer mentorship for artists and arts groups that are encountering some new technology and may need some guidance from local experts. So we invited some of our favorite local pros in these arenas, and they're with us here today. Today in the mix, we have Brandon Borns of Borns Pro Media, Rodney Gulat from Firma IT Solutions, and Raleigh and Jason Carter from 12 Legs Marketing. So while this is certainly not, you know, I, I added this Skillshare program to that series because I didn't want it just to be top down. I wanted us to be sharing with each other what's working for us. But for this conversation, we do also have a stacked deck and they'll be able to answer some of your questions. Today in the room, we also have the staff of the Cultural Office of the Pikes Peak Region. Our Executive Director, Andy Vick, is here. I'm the Deputy Director. My name is Angela Seals. And also uh, with us today are our Peak Radar Manager, Jonathan Tillman, and our Cultural Office Assistant, Rebecca Heyer. They both specialize in the Peak Radar program. And so if questions come up today about how to utilize Peak Radar Virtual, they'll be able to chime in. And they've also really had their finger on the pulse of what they see the arts community doing as it moves online. So they may chime in on those points as well. The rest of you represent um, mostly individual artists, galleries, and a couple arts organizations that are in performance as well. Uh, so I wanted to begin today um, by talking, uh, we kind of stacked the deck at the beginning too, uh, by having two topics in particular that seemed relevant. Thank you to those of you who said you had something that you wanted to share out. Uh, we're going to begin today by talking about uh, teaching online, teaching art online. Uh, and I wanted to invite uh, Amalia Dobbins, who's with us this morning. Uh, Amalia is a classically trained uh, vocalist and vocal coach. Uh, 
And also Sarah Grow Korea, whose um, Grow Music Studios has been teaching online. And the two of them have offered to share a few things that they've learned along the way and how it's going. Even if you are not an individual artist who's teaching online, you may find as a performance organization or as a gallery that some of what these folks share is totally versatile and applicable to what you're doing. Um, so I'll start by asking Sarah if you'll go first and share a, a few of your discoveries about teaching art online. Hi everyone, this is a wonderful time to get together and it uh, actually puts me in um, nicer clothes so I love being here with you all. <laughs> um, it's been six weeks today that um, we started quarantining at home, my husband and I. He's able to do all his work here and, and I work here at home or I go down to my studio. They're both pretty empty. Um, on the 13th, Friday the 13th of March, I contacted my friend uh, Amalia Dobbins to ask her if she would mess around on Zoom with me to get some ideas about how to um, teach online. We talked, we sang for each other, we talked about equipment, we talked about needing a microphone or what we could do back and forth, and we found out some really basic stuff right away. Really excited, thinking also hey, maybe this is going to help us with our overhead and maybe we just stay online. You know, just got really encouraged by each other's um, ideas. Um, from there, two days later, I was online on March 16th, teaching people online. And I think the key to that was keeping an energy, um, being a positive, optimistic, hey, we're going to do this together. This is great. Let me help you. Um, I will say it it does two things that I really, really have enjoyed. One, it gives more responsibility to the student to prepare for their side of the uh, interaction. And two, um, I've had to do a lot of prep work um, that I'm finally, after six weeks, starting to um, enjoy. So there was a lot of upfront work, but also at the same time, I was telling my students, you've got to do this, you've got to get this together, put this together, be ready with two devices at a time. So that's where I'm coming from. There. That's great, thank you, Sarah. I like how you talk about the positive energy um, because while of course all of us are going through something really serious, we're finding that as well in our communications that people are hungry for positivity um, across the board in communication. Um, so you're using Zoom as your platform. Do you have a business account? Or do you have a business Yes, I, I decided. No, I decided with my lessons. And that's another thing that Amalia and I were talking about. Do we go ahead and spend the $12, $15 a month for unlimited? And, and absolutely yes, right, Rodney? <laughs> um, because our lessons are uh, 45 minutes and you want to have that flex in between you don't want to rush people you don't want to make them feel like they're um, Unimportant because you want to save money, you know 15 bucks a month or something. So I went ahead and did that and um, uh, I bought some you know side equipment some cables and some video cameras in case I needed them They still haven't come in the mail yet. And so we just <laughs> keep going That's great I do I do use two other platforms too, so I'm balancing the other platforms. I teach a little tap dance, and they went with the Google Hangouts, mm. and then, you know, just trying to understand all the platforms and how they feel. Yeah, absolutely. You know, our first pro tips for creative video, uh, we feature Amanda Beta and she, from Inner Social Marketing, and she talks about some of what the different platforms like doing video on YouTube versus doing video on Instagram versus doing video on Facebook. And, and you bring up a good point, Google Hangouts versus Zoom. There's quite a few options out there and each of them have things that they're good at. Um, so it's helpful to hear what other people are using. Amalia, would you like to chime in about your teaching experience online? Sure. Hi everyone, so nice to see you. Um, I get so little adult interaction these days. It's so nice to see everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, 
uh, I can echo a lot of what Sarah said. We did sort of practice with each other and um, it was extremely helpful just to figure out the ins and outs of the Zoom platform. Um, I have not yet upgraded to the Zoom premium package um, because I only teach one-on-one -on -one and um, they don't limit you at 40 minutes if it's just one-on-one. -on -one. So um, I probably will hopefully start teaching some group classes and need to upgrade, but um, yeah, I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, I did invest in a Blue Yeti microphone on my end, which has really helped with sound clarity. Um, I've been able to uh, adjust the settings in Zoom so that um, so that the student uh, voices don't don't cop out. Um, there are some ways you can adjust the settings. I can let let any of the voice teachers know. Um, and um, I've really just been trying to make the transition to online as comfortable for my students as possible. I teach primarily high school students who are specializing in musical theater. Um, and so I just wanna make them feel, feel like they have a purpose, feel like they're um, in, a, in a safe nurturing environment, but yet I'm trying to light a fire under their butts because a lot of them just um, are at home, they're lethargic, they're, they've had a lot of disappointment recently. Um, and I just um, have tried to make my studio have like a cozy kind of background with like lots of posters so they can, you know, get inspired by, you know, just seeing that when they're face to face with me. Um, I, uh, let's see what else did I want to say? Um, oh, I created a practice log for my students as well to keep them accountable. Like Sarah was saying, self-accountability is really, um, a major issue right now. And, um, kids in school are, are just sort of been, be, they're given the bare minimum as a bar. Um, and it's hard it's, it's just hard to get them motivated. And I, I told them, if you're the one who practices every day, 20 minutes, um, if you're the one who practices and just keeps going during this time and just um, methodically just goes through, through the process, you will emerge ahead of everybody else who is just letting their skills atrophy and just kind of go downhill. So that's been sort of my motivating speech. I don't know how long online lessons are going to go and we just we we need to keep um holding ourselves to a high bar um we can't just let it all go so um i know there are some uh there are some products out there like voicelessons.com deals with the delay a little bit um zoom has about a half second delay and so you have to do call and response warm-ups instead of um instead of live um you can't play the, the piano, for example, along with the student, they have to just echo. So I've been doing a combination of the, the call and response and also having them mute themselves so that they can sing along when I'm playing the piano. Mm -hmm. If they're just not getting it, that's necessary um, after a while. So I'm just trying to make it as encouraging an experience as possible, but still, but still really encouraging them to grow. Um, and uh, one more technical thing, I use a hotspot instead of Wi-Fi because I've noticed a little bit of bottleneck with Wi-Fi, there's a give and take. So I've just chosen and my situation at home is I just um, need to sort of have my own internet source. So um, yeah, I think that's all I have to share. That's a great tip. Thank you so much. You know, throughout the arts community, I think there's also a bit of a philosophical conversation happening about the role of virtual in our offerings and in our programming. And I know the cultural office knows that it isn't a fit for everyone, but I think hearing you and Sarah speak up front, it's really clear that for some people, this is a critical revenue stream. Um, and for folks like you who have existing clients, it's allowing you to maintain your business. Um, how can you just quickly maybe both just say, how, how's business going? Is it helping? you maintain that revenue? Um, have you lost some students? Are you trying to recruit new folks as well? Or are you maintaining who you currently have? I have not had any students drop. Um, my students are told pretty clearly up front that they need to sign up for the semester. And so I give a big incentive for them to pay in advance. Um, I also have my students on auto pay. And so 
knock on wood, I have not had anybody drop yet. Um, so that's it's amazing. been, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, same with me. We, ha we have monthly payments, auto pay. Um, I think Amalia is one of the uh, people we talk about business side of things and it's, we can't just have it as a hobby. It is a big a part of our income and our livelihood and we enjoy doing it. Um, in fact, I did gain one new student um, just in the last month and it was Amalia's recommendation. So we're working together <laughs> and figuring out how to support one another and I'm really appreciative of that. But no, we've got some great encouragement. It, it, it's going well. Yeah, you know, I, I had asked uh, Mike Pock to also speak. A lot of you may know Mike. He's a photographer here in Colorado Springs, and he runs Three Peaks Photography and Design and also the Photography Learning Group. Um, and he, he wasn't able ultimately to be here today, but he did say that he's doing a little differently than Amalia and Sarah and that he's trying to post classes and just get public signups and that that has been challenging. Marketing, it has been challenging for him. So later in this conversation, we'll talk a little bit, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about social media. Um, we have a pro tips for creatives video out right now by 12 Legs Marketing about Instagram in particular. And some of those, leveraging some of those tools better may, may help with reaching public students. There's also just a, such a big adjustment here that we hope by continuing to communicate and market through shared marketing like peakradar.com virtual and also by referencing each other. I, I love that note, like send people to each other, <laughs> speak highly of each other. Um, we may be able to increase the amount of public participation in online class, classes in the arts uh, in the weeks and months ahead as people finish their adjustment. Yes, Sarah? I will just say one one more quick thing, and maybe the marketing people can talk to this in our meeting, but um, you know, we've, we've been through as artists, um, the Waldo Canyon fire, the Black Forest fire, and when it comes to the marketing for the arts, as far as I'm concerned with the kids, we need to find, we've always been able to think, how can we keep their lives regular? How can we keep some uh, consistency in their lives? And then also now, how can we, you know, free up an hour for parents, you know, to, to teach online. So um, that's going to be our marketing going, my marketing going into the summer. Mm -hmm. There's so many people attempting to homeschool at this time. And, and we voiced a couple things like that, like your arts community can help you with this content. <laughs> Plug your kids into the community because there's a lot of great things available not just through the, what the schools are offering virtually. Um, Rodney, I've seen you co commenting a little bit and I wanted to, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if, would, is there anything you'd like to chime in and say about teaching online or about Zoom and Zoom security? Or do you wanna wait and, and chime in later? I'm happy to chime in. Yeah, I thought you might Thank be. You. Thank <laughs> you, appreciate that. So uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for all the great work you're doing, um, you know, art, an expression of, of love and that, that creativity is what people need right now they need love they need all of your creative juices to flow in every medium possible so thank you for all the work that you're doing with that um, in regards to zoom um, I do have a um, an agreement with Fox 21 news so if you've been watching that lately you've been seeing me on there a lot um, talking about the cyber risks and all that stuff is happening during this whole COVID-19 health stuff so zoom was one of the elephants in the room that I had to address uh, so when you set up a Zoom account, it gives you the option to use your Facebook account, your Google account, or your email account to set up your account for Zoom. Do not use your Facebook account. Do not use your Google account to set up your Zoom account. Don't do it. Um, a few weeks ago, they uh, entered into a uh, class action lawsuit for a whole lot of money because of privacy concerns being leaked out to those, uh, those companies. And a lot of companies ask you for your Facebook account or your Google account to create your account for whatever platform it is because they like to share that information. Zoom is no different, but Zoom didn't put it in their user agreement, so now Zoom's getting sued for it. Um, so your best practice is to never do that. Use your email address to create an account that's just for Zoom. Um, make sure all your passwords are different for your online accounts. Uh, your password for Zoom should match any other accounts that you have. 
uh, none of your online accounts should have the same password at all. Uh, that's a huge vector for somebody to hack you because if I hack one of your accounts, I'm going to go check all the rest of them and see if they match and hack all the rest of them. Um, if you're doing public events through Zoom with like a wide distribution online for your event, uh, you might want to protect your meeting. Uh, use the waiting room option like we had for this one. Uh, use the password setting and use the registration feature. Uh, some of those features are only available through the paid version. For you folks doing the one-to-one -one meetings, it's not a big issue. But if you are massively distributing something to the people that you want them to be a part of, you definitely want to lock that meeting up. Um, even if you have like private meetings, maybe you have like a private group of people like this group, um, there was a password attached to this meeting, uh, which is good. That's what you want to do. As of April 5th, Zoom uh, made the passwords and waiting room option a default so that, you know, when you're just rushing through trying to create a Zoom meeting, those two things are activated by default to help protect you. So that's my advice on Zoom. I got advice on other stuff, but we can wait for that. That's awesome. And Rodney's going to be doing a pro tips for creative video coming up. So stay tuned yep. to the series because we have more good things coming. A uh, piece from Rodney and, and also a piece on storytelling in video by Zach Wolfson. Um, that's coming up soon. Um, so the pro tips for creatives link is in the caption box. Uh, I'd like to pivot now and talk a little bit about art sales online. Um, we have some galleries and we have a lot of individual artists who also rely on revenue and need it during this time uh, and are, are exploring ways of selling art more effectively using the internet. Um, some people were out ahead of this and have been doing it for some time. For others, this pandemic was really the kick out of the nest to figure out e-commerce and to figure out how to use social media to motivate art sales. Um, so I've asked Abby Kreuzer and Gundaga Stevens to talk a little bit about their experience so far in selling art online through their galleries. Um, Abby, would you begin for us and just share maybe a few minutes of, of what you've learned so far or what's working for you? Sure. Yeah, I, um, just like Gundy, had a sales platform for my website for just over a year now but I wasn't really finessing it. I just kind of put the shows on there and I would drive people to my website. And this whole um, pandemic got me kind of lit a fire under my butt. And, you know, I started meeting with artists, doing virtual artist talks. Um, I find that people really like to see the artists, even if they're seeing the artwork, you know, do, do you have to make it a little um, more creative than just having the pieces on your site? Um, that's the feedback I have gotten. Um, so the videos that we started with virtual first Friday and doing, um, I've done remote artist talks as well as six feet distance artist talks in the gallery so that I can share them with people online. Um, but really, I feel like it's a collaborative effort between you and B. Vredenberg and the Downtown Partnership, and me and Gundy collaborate a lot, too. And that's really what's helped drive the art sales. Um, I mean, I've been aggressive about it, and that's helped, but I think the collaboration has been huge. Um, you know, sometimes I've had people say, I'm not seeing what I want on your site, and so I send them to Gundaga or um, vice versa or somebody else. Um, I've been able to send... Um, people to individual artists that I know have websites as well. Um, so the collaboration I think has been key. The social media, I make sure that I post every morning and um, every night and I usually get, I do that ahead of time because I have a little one and I try not to just be on the computer constantly because I don't want to encourage him to be on the computer constantly. Um, so those are the things that have worked for me. Um, it's, it's really, you kind of have to be aggressive. Me and Gundy have actually talked about like, is it too much? Are we posting too much? But I've gotten positive feedback and it's actually made people really happy to see art so much online, um, whether it's social media or the websites. Yeah, a couple of the things that you just said echo some of the advice that Raleigh and Jason gave us in the Pro Tips for Creatives Instagram, which was consistency, you know, really commit to posting all the time. And then that personal thing, um, I think it's a really great point because a lot of us are lonely and like kind of hungry for each other. Like we can, you can see when some people sign on like, oh, hi. Um, and as individual artists, even if you're not a gallery who's selling many kinds of work, your own Instagram feed should show your face, should show your hands, uh, show them pieces in process. 
uh, really bring forward that sense of the creative process and that this is a person in their community. Um, that was something that um, that 12 Legs marketing video emphasized, I thought was really great advice, and that both the Kreuzer Gallery and um, G44 Gallery have been using. When Abby mentioned the collaboration and support, she's talking about Virtual First Friday, uh, which happened for the first time in April and will happen again this coming uh, First Friday of May. Uh, so you can visit that at PeteRadar.com. And if you're an artist or a gallery that's located in downtown Colorado Springs, Old Colorado City, or Manitou Springs, check that out and, and, and get involved. Um, it's free to participate and list your activities on that First Friday online. And it has been seeming to drive sales that definitely would not otherwise have happened. Um, so, so that's a resource to check out. Gundaga, would you like to chime in on, on some of what your what tactics are working for G44 Gallery in selling art online? I, I had emailed you that I didn't know if I had anything to say, but I have some, some points here. <laughs> I told you, you know more than you think. <laughs> um, let's see, I, five things quickly, I'll go through my list. Um, that I found to be helpful, <clears throat> excuse me, a sense of normalcy. Mm. Um, people are coming to Abby and my virtual space to, to see art and not to be scared or overwhelmed, but just to have beauty and look at artwork and just to have take a moment in their day to, to realize everything is hopefully going to be okay and, and just see beautiful work. Um, Point number two, I was thinking consistency. Abby mentioned that earlier, you know, be consistent on our social media. Um, post, I post daily on Instagram and Facebook and um, just be consistent. Uh, transparency as far as pricing has helped me considerably. Um, it's kind of a, a hot topic in the art world. Do you post your prices online or not? Not online, not on my website, they're posted, of course, but people are hesitant to put it on social media. I found that that has been incredibly helpful. Um, to put the next, prices of the piece, you mean? To put the prices on the, of the piece on social media, which not everybody does, and, and artists sometimes aren't comfortable with that. Um, but it has helped for me for sales because um, people can just see it right away instead of having to click another button and then clicking to my website, they can just see and then they'll message me to make a purchase. Um, accessibility kind of goes hand in hand with that. Just having it be easy for, for collectors, customers to, to find artwork, to easily per make a purchase. Um, I've had feedback for Abby and I that our websites are very easy to, to follow and to, to make a purchase. Um, some other galleries, you know, they're still working on it and it's hard for collectors to, to do that, to easily make a, a purchase of artwork. So just make it as easy as possible. Can I um, ask you, because um, this is just coming up in the past week, I've been hearing more and more about e-commerce uh, questions within the arts community. Um, do you guys, did you guys have a custom build or are you using a plugin or what are you using to sell work that's making it so easy for your users? I think Abby and I both use the same platform, uh, Shopify, and we do it ourselves. And it's pretty, I think it's pretty easy. I mean, it it's time consuming. It takes time to put everything in the gallery online, but, um, but it's very user friendly. You just kind of plug and go. It, it, they have instructions and videos on how to how to do everything. Um, so I see Abby nodding her head. So I think it's been pretty pretty user friendly to do. That's great. Um, if you are an organization uh, or a creative business who would like to talk to someone about adding e-commerce to your website, um, Twelve Legs Marketing, who's with us here today, does have that as one of the services that they offer. So. Um, feel free to reach out to them to have a conversation about what, what might work for you and how they might be able to support you adding that to your website. Um, was there anything, Raleigh and Jason, did you want to chime in or should I keep going? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, e-commerce is uh, absolutely something which should be on everybody's radar, whether you're just realizing it now or maybe you've been doing it uh, for a while. Shopify is a fantastic platform, but it, there's kind of a recurring trend which we keep on hearing, which is consistency and commitment. It, it takes time to learn it. It takes time to set it up. It takes time to, you know, make sure that you manage it correctly and it's up to date. Um, if you are moving into the online sales space um, as of right now, as you know, part of your new marketing efforts or sales efforts, um, just be mindful of the fact that you will have to somehow accept payments online. I think that's one of the most daunting things uh, really to set up. You can set up a PayPal merchant account if you just wanna have that piece of it or Shopify has the full experience. Uh, but just remember that there's the two pieces, the, the front end, which people are going to see, be able to easily navigate through the experience, whether, it, whether it's a full blown website or just one page gallery. And then the back end piece, uh, which can receive safely um, payments. So those are kind of the two main elements. Um, depending on what you sell and how you sell it, I mean, we already heard from a couple of artists that there's uh, the ability to do monthly automatic payments, which is great. You get people onto a service or, of course, if, if it's more so an artifact that you're selling, uh, then it will be a case-by-case -case basis. Facebook Marketplace is something which you have to be careful with, but could be a starting point. Um, it's not the full automated sales process like a Shopify website or a WordPress website, but you at least can start putting your art um, online in a marketplace that's, that's usable by, by many users. From there on out, I think another important component to e-commerce is how are you going to drive people to your e-commerce store? So you have your organic searches, so people going on Google and searching, or you can be the more proactive, aggressive type who is in front of the right audience through social channels, YouTube videos. I mean, you can build a full on uh, marketing strategy. Um, I don't, I stay away from saying that there's any free ways to start selling online. There's still an investment involved for good or for worse, but you could def definitely start small and grow it from there. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. Rebecca, uh, our cultural office assistant, I'm going to put you on the spot. What is the name of the merchandise plugin that we're exploring through the cultural office for Arts Month and Peak Radar? Ooh, give me one moment. Okay, could you find that for me? Um, our, our designers of our website, uh, Neon Pig Creative, recommended to us this plugin for merch. And we had not really thought a lot about having a store that could sell t-shirts or magnets or whatever um, because to us it just sounded like having merch for our arts organization was going to be a huge drain uh, in terms of our time. Um, but this plugin, this uh, service that they recommended to us, um, you don't actually get a, a box of t-shirts with Peak Radar on it that you then have to sell and mail. They, they, keep, they only make it as it's ordered and then they ship directly from this place and so you can set up you can set up a couple designs and pick what items you want it to be on there's a gallery added to your site and they handle everything in terms of sales um, so we're we're really curious and excited about that because we'd like to get um, some great merch out there for arts month um, in the future and also for peak radar and some arts advocacy messages uh, for people to wear if they'd like um, so uh, Rebecca is going to find the name of that, and if you have an either, I did. you did. What is it? Yep, it's in the comments. It's also printful.com. Printful.com. It's also linked in the comments. So Good Neon job. Pig recommended that to us, and and whether you're a theater company or a you know a, a vocal art studio or whatever, you might find that it's something you could implement with fairly low overhead. Uh, and I don't know how large sales would be, but it would be a revenue stream that didn't exist before. Uh, okay, at this time I'm going to open up the floor uh, to anyone else who would like to share tips and tricks of what they're learning. Um, we do have uh, Jim's here from Milibo Art Theater. They've been doing a great series, hilarious series, Babette's Kitchen, performing online. Uh, Deb Thornton is here um, and she always has innovative ideas including, uh, you know, her experience for years with the Portal Project through uh, the Imagination Celebration uh, and then quite a few individual artists 
uh, and photographers who may have learnings as well from social media to how you're we're interacting with your audience. So um, feel free to go ahead and unmute mute yourself at this time and offer something if you'd like to share any discoveries or tips for the group. Hi, uh, this is Jim Jackson, and uh, yeah, I just uh, uh, what Sarah was said, which is consistent uh, comes to promoting through social media is really the key. Um, and we found this when we were using Facebook and Instagram to promote our shows. Um, it, those really become mainstays for promoting the theater shows during the season. And when the shows ended, um, Creating this Babette's Kitchen was a way to daily uh, be in touch with our uh, our followers uh, and people who who come to the theater love the theater. So uh, it's a, it's a, a substitute for live performance. Uh, I'm uh, of still of the belief that it's a very poor substitute, but we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. Yeah, thank you for saying that. You know, I've had reporters ask me in some interviews in the past few weeks, so is like the arts community is going to be virtual now? And I've answered, I hope not. Like so much of what we experience in the arts is interpersonal. Um, but certainly right now, these virtual strategies can be helpful in uh, maintaining our organizations a little bit um, in the break. Uh, Abby, did you want to say something about that? Yeah, um, I agree with you, but I do want to say I have gotten so much feedback from people about how much they love the virtual First Friday, and they hope that even when we do reopen, it's something that's available because sometimes it's hard to get out on First Friday, or some people don't really like the crowds, and they may come to the venue later, but the, the being able to go to one spot and watch videos from all of the galleries has been very exciting for many people. And I've, like I said, had feedback that they hope that continues. So I don't know if that's something you guys have explored, but me and Gundy have talked about continuing it for us. And if there is a platform on Peak Radar still available, I think it would be a good thing. Yeah, you know, I, I can't speak to the future of Virtual First Friday, there's a lot of people involved in that project, but I do think there's a lot of layers here that could continue. And things like a, like a video gallery tour or a sneak peek of a show or interviews with local artists that we're seeing in the past few weeks are things we could have always been doing. Um, and so I, I agree, it can, I think some of the virtual work that we're exploring right now can be an important long-term layer uh, and I also think we need to keep getting better at it. Um, and that's part of what the Pro Tips for Creative Series was about too, was helping us increase our quality. Because I think early on, everyone was just thrilled to see each other. Uh, it was okay if you were half in the dark, in a hoodie, with a broken up feed, no one cared. They were just thrilled to see you online. Uh, I think, you know, by another month or two of this, then where our expectations may start to change. Um, and so we want to keep growing as a sector in our tech ability. Uh, and I'd, I'd, at this point, going to recommend uh, Brandon Bourne's video about video production that he did for us for Pro Tips for Creatives. Uh, he has some really great advice. In fact, Brandon, you see I have backlighting here behind me, and that was because of your advice uh, in that video about adding depth. So I, I hope you're all finding me to be visually deep. Um, Deborah, did you want to say anything about the portal project? It's, uh, it's such a unique tool uh, and it, it, it brings up a point that I, I think is a good one, which is that our arts community moving online also makes us more visible nationally and internationally. Whether it's through a specifically international tool like the portal or just through the internet, we have people now being able to tune into Bad Bad's Kitchen who live, you know, in Kansas or in New York. So. Uh, can you speak a little bit to the portal project and what's happening with that? Yes, thanks, Angela. Um, I I think we just lost your. I did want to say I was a little. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying I was a little concerned when Amalia 
um, touted the fact that we're in a room full of adults and how exciting that is because obviously she hasn't spent time with Jim Jackson. Um, <laughs> and I could appreciate the fact that Abby's groomer is part of the gathering this morning too and that those are really important elements to our working together. Um, well, the reason I thought about the portal is that it's a platform that we've been using where we're connecting with people around the world. And right now we're not inside the portal either, but I am connecting with about 40 sites around the world. <clears throat> and so it does give us another opportunity to be able to share out. From our region to reach other regions. And even if you're, Sarah and um, Amalia and other parts of the world. Um, so I'm, that is a resource for us to help connect with places. Um, but I'm also asking you to think about, as you're doing this, I'm also looking at the What If Festival that's in the fall. Mm -hmm. And because we're having to rethink and reinvent those. I just lost your audio. Could you go back to experiences as well? Okay. Yes. Can you hear Could you me? Go back to we're having to reinvent and then we're, finish that thought for us. We're having to reinvent the festival in terms of large gatherings of people. Yeah. Um, the festival, the What If Festival of Innovation and Imagination has run for 10 years and basically it's a stealth arts festival. We don't call it an arts festival because we're very intentional about trying to attract people that don't always um, self-select. So that's what I'm inviting to is you're thinking about as we look at how we go online, um, we'd like to put a big push on it, whether it's in September or whatever the timing is, we're really looking at how do we draw a lot of attention to this broader community art. Deb, can you try turning that, on for your video? Connected with over the years. Art. Yes. So we Sorry. get your audio. You, you were you were saying you were encouraging everyone to focus on. Thank you. Yeah. We're encouraging everyone to focus on the creativity and the innovation that's happening right now. And so it's definitely happening throughout, throughout all fields in our region. And, but this is a great opportunity to really get a lot of attention on the arts and that'll certainly happen during Arts Month. And so we're looking at how we can help lead up to that. And so asking you to think about um, as we're polishing up our abilities online um, ways that we might plug that in. Absolutely, that's such a great point. You know, I don't, just like you are thinking about the future of what if for 2020, we are asking questions about the future of Arts Month for 2020. But one thing that is certain is that we are gonna have co collaborative marketing initiatives, whether it's one large one where we all proclaim together or a series throughout the rest of the year. Um, and we're, the cultural office uh, is going to be heading up a, a kind of a working group to think about what that should look like. Um, but yeah, like everyone else, we're, we're going to be redesigning for the current opportunities. How's that? <laughs> uh, thank you. And thank you. You're always, you know, a person, I think, who inspires what is possible. So thank you for mentioning that big picture of us being really visible internationally. Sarah, did you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted just two quick points. One to Deb. Um, I love that the innovation has always been in the title of the Stealth Festival and in no time like the present. And she's right. I've, I've kept relationships with the people that I've lived around in the past years, all my life in Missouri and Arizona, things like that. And now I'm able to give them online lessons and connect with them at a deeper level. Uh, second thing I wanted to say was um, 
I'm thankful for this group. I'm thankful for the creative energy that's happening right now. You people are not waiting around for others to tell you to continue living. You know, um, you're not telling, you're not waiting for the government to tell you how to run your business. You're doing it. You're carving out the space. And I'm really thankful to see that because I've been energized too. I'm going from teaching into a little bit more business side for teachers. And that's really making me happy. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that we've got business people here and, and supporters of the arts as well as artists. Absolutely. Um, we believe the sector is resilient. We are also very aware of the seriousness, of the gravity of the situation we're all in. Um, but some of that fire uh, is producing already new artwork and new solutions um, that I think are good too. Um, and the point of new artwork, there are some, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of conversation in the arts community about why do we feel so pressured to create new work? We're sad and we're exhausted and that's fine. Um, but there are some neat opportunities right now, including the three by three uh, collaborative residencies that the Fine Arts Center just announced. Uh, and we have those on the COVID-19 arts response resource page at culturaloffice.org. The link is in the group chat here. And we keep that updated every day. So in addition to 30 funding sources as of right now for arts uh, groups, businesses, and artists, we also have uh, residencies and invitations to create work if you're interested in that. And if you have some that we don't have, please send them to us. Uh, for the last 10 minutes, I thought um, I'd open the floor also to our pros who are in the room. Um, Brandon, Rodney, Raleigh, and Jason, do you have some tips that you'd like to bring up to this group that we haven't maybe touched on yet that you think would be good advice, whether it's um, platforms to check out or techniques to try, tactics to try, uh, warnings to keep us all grounded, Rodney? <laughs> Rodney's specialist in cybersecurity, so he keeps it real, keeps us safe. Um, and no, Brandon, we haven't heard from you yet either, so I'd love to hear a tip from you before we close. There was a quick question in the chat from Amalia. Um, says, I'd love to hear any ideas about marketing online services to a broader um, national audience. And she mentioned, you know, she's gotten pretty comfortable with teaching online. And now how can she kind of spread that message out? And um, as we said in our video, um, the easiest, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, would be to start posting those on social media and opening up your audience um, via hashtags. Um, the research can be done on Twitter and Instagram uh, to find out what hashtags are getting the most um, love at a time, um, you know, which are being used on a, on a consistent basis. So that would be one kind of quick, if you will, um, easy way, again, easy way to um, try and spread your message across um, a platform to, to people who may not be your followers or may not even live within uh, the city or state. And another one um, would be through um, a little bit more of a, a paid option, but. Um, yeah, I mean, so the best way to go after a national audience is obviously to be aggressive and spend money on media, but that's not always the option. What we're trying right now with a local podcast um, is actually doing social media listening to find conversations that are happening through social media channels, through forums, through all sorts of different avenues where people are seeking out the information that's being presented in this podcast. And in a similar fashion, if you're selling a specific type of class, you can start doing social media listening to find people who are talking about it or maybe asking their friends if they know anyone they would recommend. And you basically uh, join the conversation, you can tag them, you can you know, find quickly the, the actual chain of communication and add a comment to it. Um, the tip there would be try to keep it organic, uh, especially when you're taking that slightly more outside of the box approach. People don't want to be sold to in a very direct way. So you might wanna just start the conversation share some uh, you know information that could be useful to that person and start building that rapport um and, and and trust of course the other ways as i mentioned are to start running ad campaigns um facebook is a very efficient media uh, you can literally reach anybody across the globe and you can segment people uh based on their interests so that can help you 
you just need to be mindful of kind of if you think about the marketing funnel, you obviously have your awareness side of things, which tends to uh, require more impressions. It can become expensive quickly, but then from there kind of building out the experience to where based on people's engagement, what are they engaging with? Are they asking you questions? Kind of molding the remaining part of your paid campaigns. Um, no easy solution. I mean, they're easy in the sense of if you sit down and plan it well, you can launch it and deploy it, but it still will take time and creativity and just trying out new things, really. Thank you. Yeah. Brandon, do you have, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, not only are you so great at multimedia, but as an influencer on social and a person who's built a really powerful following on the front range, mm -hmm. I'd be interested to hear from you um, and a creative business owner if you have any quick tips for the room. All right. Hello, my name is Brandon Borns with Borns Pro Media. And thanks for, uh, I'm enjoying this uh, conversation and listening to what people have to say. If I have one tip, um, I, I do do a lot of multimedia, but also have a, a full-time job. So a lot of this is my, my side hustle. <laughs> and, and so it takes a lot of time. So one thing I've been forced to do is find uh, good partnerships when it comes to people who, other people who do multimedia, other people who share good content. And so a lot of what I do is trying to connect with people who have good content and say, can I reshare your content? I got kids upstairs, I'm sorry for me. Um, uh, I just try to connect with people who have good content and say. Oops, you suddenly are muted. I don't know why. Brandon, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I think the partnership is big for me. And even recently, um, some partnerships. So I think a few weeks ago, I before, before the quarantine was really serious, I did a, a live stream with um, Tony Exum Jr. And I did a fundraiser for him. So um, we just did like a live streaming show and raised about $300 people donated, but everything was through uh, my platform. So even though they donated to him, I still got all the contact information to people to say thank you to let them know about what I'm doing. And so I also do that for um, like, uh, so I have like an online marketplace I'm building and that started a while ago, but it's, it's, I guess, more appropriate now or relevant now. So like another business in the area that was selling masks, I just had them um, sell. I just probably they probably sold like 20 through my website and they, they get like automatic vendor commission. So it's, it's like I'm just trying to find good products to, to sell and they get paid for it. And I get some contacts and I can send them some of my um, media about the platform I have. I love that you brought up building your list because that's something we haven't really talked about, but that's certainly something we should all be thinking about because it's much harder to get to people right now if you don't have a way of getting into their inbox or connecting with them on a social platform. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm always trying to build, build contacts because um, even I think this, yeah, this last week I've, I sell some magazines for my black Colorado, which is a black directory for, the area and um i mean i got a subscription yesterday i got a subscription the day before that i got to send out seven magazines today so people are still buying magazines and buying subscriptions but a lot of it's just me just partnering with other people and just trying to use that partnerships to gain exposure and some people are getting magazines for buying other products on my website and so it's just uh just trying to find different ways to partner with people to raise exposure and I've all, and also yeah so that's Sorry. one tip those are those are great tips and I'd encourage you guys to plug into my black Colorado follow them on social uh, as you can tell um, Brandon and Jenny have a great way of thinking about in, about influencing and building following and I, and I find that I learned just by watching what they do uh, and and hopefully vice versa we can all learn from each other um, so we're coming up on the 11 o'clock hour. I feel like this has been really productive and I appreciate that you all took an hour to to share with each other uh, for some co-learning. We are all always co-learners.
um, but particularly in times of crisis when things are changing very fast. Um, so I'll encourage you to um, continue to reach out to each other, um, continue to participate with the cultural office, follow us on Facebook, please sign up for our emails. We send them about two or three times a month. Um, we are trying to put really critical information in there and keep following that resource page, which we update every day for relief funding sources, creative opportunities, and best practice articles that may help you as you continue to navigate this as an arts community. Um, I wanna thank um, our pros who are with us today. Uh, Brandon Borns from Borns Pro Media, Rodney Gulat from Firma IT Solutions. Thank you, Rodney. We look forward to your video coming up soon on the Pro Tips for Creatives series. Uh, and Raleigh and Jason Carter from 12 Lakes Marketing. Amanda Beta from Inner Social Marketing is also one of our series pros uh, and is expecting the baby imminently and so is not here. Uh, life continues, my friends. Uh, and thank you all for, for signing on and for sharing. Um, I also want to thank David Siegel from the B. Vredenberg Foundation for joining us today and for all the B. Vredenberg Foundation's help for the sector behind the scenes and particularly through the Artist Relief Fund and Virtual First Friday. Uh, and for our staff uh, from the cultural office who's here. Uh, and for each of you, like Sarah said, we're the activators. We're out there making stuff happen. We're figuring it up figuring it out, sometimes failing publicly. That's what it takes to innovate. Uh, sharing what we learn is what it takes to innovate. And cheering each other on, which thank you, Rodney, for all your cheering in the right-hand column. That's what we should be doing. It's been a theme all through the conversation. Refer people to each other, hyperlink to each, you know, cross-reference each other, cross-promote each other, and we'll keep doing that from the cultural office and from peakradar.com. Uh, thank you all, and if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to me or to info at culturaloffice.org. Uh, we'll be posting a recording of this session on the event page and on the Pro Tips for Creatives webpage, if I can figure out how to do that. Bye, everyone. <laughs>